So for our next example, let's look at surgical wound infections. So as I've said multiple times in this video, I currently work in orthopedics. So we'll take the example of an orthopedic operation. So let's say we've got a patient who's had a total hip replacement and the surgical incision they make for that is usually in the lateral aspect of the upper thigh. Now, after the surgery then, they stitch up the surgical incision and the hope is that the skin will just heal over nicely and often that does happen. However, not too rarely they do get infected and classically the way that that presents is as a cellulitis. So the subcutaneous fat gets infected. So it's now open to the air through the surgical incision and gets infected that way. So you often see spreading redness from around the surgical wound and that's the indication that it is infected. And you hope to God whenever you see that, that it's only a superficial infection and, the, and that the bacteria haven't actually got deeper into where the metalwork is because once the bacteria have actually colonized the surface of the metalwork, it's phenomenally difficult to treat that uh, after that. But if it is just a superficial surgical wound infection, then you treat it just like cellulitis, where the first line treatment would be flucloxacillin. But if the individual's penicillin allergic, an alternative that you could use is oral doxycycline. Next, some examples from primary care and dermatology. So doxycycline is also used as a long-term antibiotic to treat acne and rosacea. So let's go over these skin conditions. So hopefully everyone watching knows what acne is. It's a skin condition that often affects adolescents and it is an infection of the hair follicles, usually on the face, that is caused by too high sebaceous activity. So all over our body, the skin has hair follicles, little indentations where the hairs are growing. Even on parts of your skin where you don't think you have hairs, you do have hairs. They're just very small and you can't see them. So all over your skin, apart from the skin on the surface of the hands and the soles of the feet, those are the only two exceptions. All the other parts of the skin do have hair follicles and tiny little hairs that you can't necessarily see. And these hair follicles have glands coming off the side of them called sebaceous glands, which is what's shown here in yellow, and they secrete an oily substance called sebum that lubricates the hair gland. Now, in the teenage years, driven by hormones, the sebaceous glands enlarge quite a lot, especially on the facial region, and they end up secreting far too much sebum, therefore, and give teenagers oily faces. And this sebum can clog up these pores on the face and they then get infected by a bacterium and cause inflammation around the hair follicle and little red dots on the face, which is the spotty appearance of acne. Now the bacterium that grows in these sebum clogged pores is called Propionibacterium acnes. And that bacterium is sensitive to tetracycline antibiotics such as doxycycline. And therefore, acne can be treated by putting teenagers on long-term tetracycline antibiotics. Now, normally, the antibiotic that is prescribed isn't actually doxycycline. Usually, it's one of the other tetracyclines that we mentioned right at the start of the video. Linocycline or oxytetracycline, these are more normal tetracyclines to be put on for acne. However, doxycycline can be used, and if it is used, it would be used at this normal dose of 100 milligrams once daily. So teenagers can actually end up taking doxycycline for months, if not years, to treat their acne, or they can take one of its brothers, limocycline or oxytetracycline. As I say, in the UK, the main one that we see used is limocycline, which has a brand name, Tetralizal. So tetracyclines are massively effective at improving the appearance of acne because they stop the sebaceous clogged pores from getting infected by this bacterium 
and it's the infection with the bacteria that then triggers the inflammation and the appearance of the red spot and therefore it massively improves the appearance of the skin condition to take a tetracycline antibiotic. So really this is testimony to the safety of tetracyclines that we can put teenagers on these antibiotics for potentially years and they don't get any horrific side effect from them. So if you're ever afraid to prescribe doxycycline, don't be. Remember back to the fact that teenagers can take these for years without having problems. So the other extremely common skin condition that tetracyclines can be used to treat is rosacea. So if you don't know what rosacea is, it is basically the name for having a red face. So it is very common, especially amongst Caucasian people. So if you live in a Caucasian country, even just going to the supermarket, you will see several individuals who suffer from rosacea. It's so common, in fact, that many people aren't even aware that it has a medical name. Many people just think of their red face, especially men, just think of their red face as being part of them uh, and don't realise that there is actually a medical name for this skin condition that they have. Now some people might currently be shouting at their computer screen saying, Ben, no, wait, there are other skin conditions that can cause redness of the skin on the face, and that is certainly true. And one of the major differentials for rosacea would be a condition called KPRF, which stands for Keratosis pilaris rubra facii. Now, if you have never heard of this condition, this is another condition of the hair follicles where the follicles get plugged up for a different reason to an acne. In acne, it's the overactive sebaceous glands that clog up the pores and they then get infected. In keratosis pilaris rubra facii, the pores, the hair follicles on the face, get clogged up from skin cells. So the skin is very, very active in these individuals and it produces too much skin in these sorts of regions and if you imagine these two edges these two boundaries of the hair follicle here growing in on one another and clogging up the pore that way that is what happens in keratosis pilaris rubra facii and then the whole thing becomes mildly inflamed and red so you get tiny little red dots smaller than the red dots that you get in acne in keratosis pilaris rubra facii and this causes the sort of appearance of red cheeks classic. It's a very classic distribution. So if you've never seen this condition, Google it. And I guarantee you, you will have seen people with this condition. And then Google what rosacea looks like and you'll see that there is a difference. Rosacea people look as though they are just badly sunburned. Indeed, that is how I would advise you to decide whether someone has rosacea. If you look at their face and think this person looks sunburned, but they're not sunburnt, they're, they look like this all the time, that is probably rosacea. It, you might end up being wrong in a few cases. They might have, let's say, facial eczema, rare in an adult, but it's possible. Uh, but I would say in 99% of the cases, you, will be, you won't go wrong with that uh, way of thinking. If you look at someone and it looks as though they're sunburnt, but that's how they look all the time, that is probably rosacea. Whereas if you go on Google and look at the pictures of people with keratosis pilaris rubra facii, you will hopefully agree that those people don't look sunburnt. They have a very classical distribution where it's in their lateral cheeks and then the rest of their face, especially the skin around their mouths and the skin of their nose, is spared from the condition and is a normal colour. Whereas in rosacea, classically, the skin of the nose is often the worst affected. So it's classically the redness is most intense around the nose, just as it would be in a sunburn. So if you didn't know what these two skin conditions were prior to this video, hopefully you'll realise that going around life, especially in a Caucasian country, you see people with these all the time. This one more so than this one. This is a little bit rarer to see. Now the cause of rosacea is not yet understood. It's an outstanding problem in dermatology. However, despite the fact that we don't know the cause of it, we do have treatments for it. And tetracycline antibiotics are usually quite effective at treating it. So again, like in acne, the treatment would usually be with either limacycline or oxytetracycline. And I do occasionally see people admitted uh, under my care who are on long-term limacycline or oxytetracycline for rosacea and then I continue that on whilst they're an inpatient with us. 
However, doxycycline can be used for this purpose, and again, it would be given at a dose of 100 milligrams once daily, and it can be continued for incredibly long periods of time, potentially indefinitely, to prevent uh, the rosacea in these individuals. And usually, if you take it for long enough, it does seem to work. It does seem to make these individual skin return to a less red complexion. So I'm going to end the video here. There are further uses of doxycycline that I haven't gone into in this video. Two major ones would be in the treatment of chlamydia and also its use as malaria prophylaxis. Now, I don't actually have any clinical experience of using it for either of those two purposes, and therefore I don't have any interesting insights to give you, so I'm not going to say anything more about those other than to mention them. Overall, doxycycline is a highly safe and highly effective antibiotic. Just make sure that the patient isn't allergic to tetracyclines before you give it to them.